If any of you have watched the news lately, any of the news, you've seen it's all bad. I was watching the other day, some people in Syria were throwing dead bodies over a bridge into the water, and their bodies would float downstream into the ocean. And we see all types of violence around the world, theft, murder and all types of corruption, even right here in our own country. And you might wonder, why are people like this? What is it? The Bible gives us a reason. It states that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things who can know it. Now, does that mean just the people we watch on television doing these horrible things? Or does it mean when you look in the mirror, do you see the same type thing? A heart that is desperately wicked. Well, you're no different than any of us. All of us were born desperately wicked. But through grace, we've been given a solution. Now, there's a lie out there that somehow you can be good. And God will smile upon you for your good deeds and will welcome you into heaven with open arms. That's a lie. It's a satanic lie. You'll even find it in so-called churches. You'll even find it among people who call themselves Christian. And I've noticed in my lifetime, a lot of people have told me they don't want anything to do with Christianity because there's no way they could be as good as they want you to be. Why, they say to me, I like to smoke. They say to me, I like to do certain things. And they t tell me when I go to their churches, you can't really be a Christian and do that. You can't be a Christian and do this, that, and the other, or whatever taboo they've decided to create. Man-made taboos. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not what it's all about. Their hearts, too, are deceitful. And you say, but there's this battle in the world between good and bad. Take a look in the mirror. We all have skeletons in our closet. I do. You do. We all do. There are things that we will keep to ourselves until we go to the grave. And you will never tell a soul because you're ashamed of it. Why? Your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Now we try to compensate. We want to be good. We want God to accept us, of course. But guess what? We're not good enough. Someone asked our Lord if he was good enough to get into heaven. He told him, no, you must be born again. And then someone else went up to the Lord and said, Lord, you are good. Actually, he called him rabbi. He didn't recognize him as Lord. He said, Rabbi, you are a good man. And our Lord said, No one is good. Not even one. Do you walk around with your head up high, thinking about how good you are, and how you don't do thus and so as your neighbor? Or do you sit in church and look at someone of whom you've called a hypocrite, because you've seen them do something you don't like? What makes you any better? All of us have hearts that are deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. You can't work your way into heaven. If you call yourself a Christian and you're running around talking about working your way into heaven, you might as well be a Muslim. They work a lot harder to get into what they consider heaven than you ever would imagine. That is not the way of salvation. There's only one way of salvation. And there's only one name given among men under heaven by which man can be saved. And that is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it was the Lord Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life. He's the only one who did not have a heart that was deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. In fact, the Bible tells us his heart was free from deceit. None of us can claim that. 
only the Lord Jesus Christ. But why? Why would he live a perfect life for 33 years on the earth? Only to be tortured. Only to be ridiculed. Only to be hung on a cross and cry out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means in Aramaic, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew why, but he was saying it for our benefit. He was being forsaken for you and for me because our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. And only he could die as a substitute for our wretchedness. Look in the mirror. You're wretched. I don't care how handsome you look. I don't care what type of clothes you put on. You're wretched. You have wretched thoughts. We all have. But there's a solution. God doesn't leave us hanging. We're born into depravity. In Adam all die. I've heard a preacher say that many times. He said he got on an elevator and he met a man and he was at a conference where he was preaching and he kept telling this man in the elevator over and over and over again as he got on the elevator. He said he felt led to tell this man that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's a true statement, but he cut it off right there. And I started thinking about this pastor and I thought, why does he keep saying this and he doesn't give the good news? That's bad news. We are to give good news. And then again, he gave bad news the next day on the elevator. The same man happened to be there. And he said, and he repeated the same phrase, that, that you are without God. You are without salvation. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the man walked off the elevator again. Then the third day, he said he got on the elevator and said the same thing, giving the bad news. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which is true. We all have. I have. You have. Every member of the human race has, except the Lord. And that's where he left off. He did not give the answer. But by the grace of God, the man had the answer on the third day because the preacher got on the elevator and said and Adam all die and he looked at him in the same way and said that same short weird phrase to somebody he didn't even know and then the man looked right back at him and said but in Christ shall all be made alive now the preacher was giving the bad news which was wrong we're to give the good news. And he was rebuked by someone else who knew the good news. And the good news is this. In Christ shall all be made alive. You can't work your way into heaven. It's all through scripture. There are so many verses. I'll give you some of them. But it is impossible to ever reconcile that you must work or you must do something to move your way into heaven, that you can some way impress God by abstaining from some type of behavior, by abstaining from drinking, chewing, smoking, or better yet put, drinking, smoking, chewing, and, go, and going with girls who do. But that is not part of salvation. It may be part of bad news. It may be part of high, bad hygiene. But it has nothing to do with salvation. For the Bible is very clear when it comes to salvation as to how we are saved. First of all, down south where I lived, everyone began to preach this one thing. Invite Christ into your heart and you will be saved. And it sounds beautiful. And many people do so. And you may throw up in your hands and say, Amen. They've invited Christ into their heart and they are saved. Amen. Hallelujah. But it's not in the Bible. No, it's not there. And you may be scratching your head wondering, who is this guy talking to me? I've never heard such strange words. Well, you better listen. Because when the Lord spoke and when the Apostle Paul spoke and when Peter spoke of the gospel, people all stood around and said, I've never heard 
such strange words? Well, we can't invite Christ anywhere. And it, says, and it teaches us this in the Scripture. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, our Lord makes it clear that the way of salvation is through Him. We, we don't even ask. We don't even invite. How can we invite? Our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. How dare us invite perfect God anywhere? He wouldn't even accept us. But he will because of grace. But you have to follow what he says. And what did our Lord say in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28? He said, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You go to him. You don't invite him to yourself. Now that scripture some of you may be turning red-faced and becoming angry, but I'm here to tell you, your eternal life may depend on this one fact. Have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? He's invited you to believe, and that's it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not from yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How many of you on Christmas morning how many of you have made your children get up and scammer around and clean the dishes and do the floors and wash the whole house spotless before you hand them a present? If you have, you're crazy. You don't. You give them freely their gifts. Why? You love them! And God loves us a billion times more than we could ever understand our own love toward our own children. He's in, and he's given to us salvation. He has given to us a gift. And whether you know it or not, it's Christmas for you. All you have to do is accept the gift. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to invite Christ into your heart or into your house to give it to you. He's already got it laid out right there, right in front of you. It's not even under a tree. All you have to do is say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the very moment of your salvation. Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And if anyone in your household believes, they too shall be saved. John 3, 16. God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son so that whosoever believes in him should never perish but have eternal life. And why? Because he bore the burden on the cross. While he was hanging on the tree between a thief and another man who was also a murderer and a thief, the thief said, Lord, remember me when you get to heaven. Now that was an expression of his faith. That was an expression of the fact that he had believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. And guess what? Up until that point, he'd been a thief. His entire life, stealing from the hard-earned money of others. And we know how hard it is to come by money now, and it was even much harder back then. And he was a thief who would steal other people's labor, other people's sweat. And he had been a thief that way until he was hanging on that cross in between heaven and hell. And then he realized, this man beside me has done nothing. And then he came to realize, this man beside me is the Son of God. And then he had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and he expressed it by telling him, Lord, don't forget me. And then what did the Lord say? This very day, you will be with me in paradise, a mere thief. Now the man on the other side ridiculed him, laughed at him, mocked him. He said, if ye be the Son of God, jump off of here and get us off of here also. That man made the wrong choice. And he's not in heaven. He's in hell. So right now you have the same choice. You, as it were, are hanging on a 
cross between the Lord. Where are you going to go? What choice are you going to make? Are you going to realize that he is the Savior? Or are you going to ridicule and mock and say, I'll be good enough myself? Well, right now, you have that opportunity to simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that will be the time of your salvation. All you have to do in thought only, you can bow your head, you can keep your eyes open, you can be driving down the road, whatever you're doing. And all you have to do is say, Father, I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died as a substitute on the cross for my sins. And that is the moment of your very salvation. And now that you've made that choice, and I hope you've made that choice to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a spiritual life to live afterward. And if you're interested in knowing what that's all about, you can go to www. AELewisMinistries.org and there's no spaces, no capital letters. It's all lowercase and it's all together. www.little a, little b, l e w i s, no space, m i n, ministries, m i n i s t r i e s.org.